So a little, little background, at least on Jason and I, um, we grew up in a family that hunted for sure and then even guided. Um, three, third generation guides. I guided for a little bit, Jason's guided. Uh, my dad and my grandpa guided like heavy guiding for you know, 25, 30 years maybe. Um, and in that time, horses were a big part of that. Um, so I, I understand pretty well horses, um, what their mentality is like, how we use them to hunt, how we use them in tax strings and stuff like that. Um, and then just backcountry hunting in general. So, so we, we've kind of transitioned out of, you know, we don't guide anymore or anything like that, um, but we do a lot of backcountry hunting. And that kind of has led us to pack animals because anyone who's hunted the backcountry knows it's only a matter of time or you can only pack out so many elk seven miles deep when it's just you and your buddy on your backs before you go throw your hands up and say this is stupid like this is stupid i mean this is it's it's killing me to do this and having lost elk meat because i thought that you know we could get stuff out of time and we couldn't and all that kind of you know that horror story um we i don't think we hunt elk anymore without a pack animal available unless I, when do you hunt elk by the road, I guess. I, we always have a pack animal for elk, at least. And, and even for deer. Um, so that's kind of our background. So let's talk about some reasons why we'd use pack animals. The distance. That's the simple one, right? It's like, we just want to go further. We want to get in deeper. And I don't want to pack my own stuff to get in there. Um, even though we've got our backcountry gear dialed to about, I don't know, a five, seven day hunt, not including water and unlike our weapon, 45 pound pack, and that's, it's pretty doable. I mean, we, it's doable for us, we'll go, we'll go 15 miles with that. Um, that's not the problem, it's once you kill. And so we're in Wyoming last year, Jason and I, last year, two years ago, and we both had tags, we both had rifle tags, and we packed in eight miles, we're about eight miles deep, up in some nasty stuff, you know, up in the, whatever range that is, and we both, we literally both, yeah, he doesn't want to say, I don't want to say either, we both knocked down, we both knocked down bucks, at, at literally, not literally, but within three minutes of each other, they're, they're two bucks feet out, they're with each other, if you saw it, it was like in the snow a couple years ago, we posted a picture of it, they're laying right next to each other, they died within five feet, well, 50 yards, so we've got two bucks, down, we packed in, we've got camp on our back, and we want to make one trip and get this over with, and we're in some nasty country. 125 pounds later, and eight miles, I'm like, that, it was, I was done, that was it. Um, your body can just only handle so much, and that was about, that was about my max. 125 pounds, you got a boned out buck, you got all of your 40 pounds original camp, and then you got, you know, a little bit of water and the head in the cave. And we were going like 100 yards and then sitting down 100 yards. And that was downhill, um, but, you know. And so we, we want to be able to go deep. We want to be able to go eight miles deep and still get an animal out. Um, that, that's kind of the meat care, too. Um, another reason is just, especially with an elk hunt or something bigger like that, um, have a way to get the elk meat out without ruining it or... Um, you know, we're hunting with three or four guys a lot of times, we all have tags, and if we don't have a pack animal there, then everyone else's hunt gets put on pause, right? We've all been there where we're kind of out and like, oh, your buddy killed and now you're packing elk meat for the rest of two days or whatever. Um, but the, the meat care, um, we have to, as hunters, we have to, you know, think ethically and take care of the meat. Um, maybe the terrain itself just doesn't, you know, you just, you just, you know, we, we hunt the Ruby Mountains from time to time, and like, that's just, it's brutal. Um, you know, you're going from four or 5,000 feet up to 10,000 feet, you know, in the matter of, you know, a couple of miles. Um, and so maybe you just want to use pack animals to get up into nastier country. A more comfortable camp. Uh, this was a hard one for us, because we, we've been doing the backpack hunting for so long, and you know how that world is, like, every ounce you can cut, you do it, and so we're like, whittling these packs down to nothing, and then we, we rent llamas for the first time a few years ago, and we're, walk, we're, we're in Idaho, and we're walking through Walmart, and we're adding up the weight that we have, and like, geez, we, are, we still have like 20 pounds each, 
And we don't know what to put in our packs. <laughs> like, we're, we ran out of ideas. So I, I grabbed a six pack of Dr. Pepper and threw that in and like a bunch of donuts and just like things that we, we just weren't used to hunting this way. And so it's nice. It's nice when you're in there for seven days and you can crack open a Dr. Pepper or, you know, maybe a steak or something like that and not be eating Mountain House and, you know, iodine water. So, um, big, big thing too for us, like that Nevada hunt we've packed into several times. Um, we can get our 45 pound packs in there, but we're usually work the next day. Like the next day might be, you know, kind of an off day or pretty casual where if you're walking in with 10 pounds on your back, you're fresh on the opener rather than your legs are already beat and you're just starting to hunt. So Yeah, I mean, we spent, we spent so much money and vacation days to do these things that we love. Um, if you've only got, say, a seven-day window for a hunt and you're not in as good a shape as you should be, or even if you are, um, those packings are brutal. And to go in and, you know, I've been there. I've been there where you have to go in and you have to waste a morning recovering because you just, you hiked into such nasty country that you can't hunt the next day and your pack was, you know, 55 pounds or whatever. Uh, maybe you have physical limitations. You know, maybe, you're, maybe you want to go hunt with kids. Sure makes it a lot easier to pack, you know, a couple of kids stuff or your wife stuff or whatever in on some pack llamas or goats or horses or whatever um, so that they can come enjoy it with you or maybe you just can't physically bear you know 50 pound pack to get in five miles and hunt for seven days like that and so then you know then you can use pack animals um, another reason so maybe you're going to a new unit and I put the drop camp there because that to me is like a little hidden gem I think that guys can get they can, they can, it's almost a roundabout way of, of scouting a unit. If you're willing to pay an outfitter for a drop camp, and we'll talk about that, um, typically they're willing to take you into a good hunting area. If you, if, you, if you say, hey, I'm looking at these couple different spots, they might narrow it down for you. Do you see what I'm saying? Like if, you, if you're willing to hire a packer and he's using his animals to get you in, um, it's kind of like you know, you're, you're paying him money, and I think there's a reciprocity there where he's willing to um, say, hey, you know, I think this drainage might be better than, than this basin that you're looking at or something like that. Um, and so you can use it to your advantage, I think. Um, and then just enjoy it. Maybe you just like being around animals, pack animals or whatever. It's, it's been a riot with us with the llamas for the last two or three years. Um, something new every day with llamas. Uh, and then, you know, we had plenty of stories to tell about horses growing up. So That's a couple reasons why. Any questions on that so far? Anybody in here have pack animals of any kind? A couple people. Cool. So that's kind of our, our main categories here. Horses, mules, llamas, goats is what we're going to touch on. And I'm, I'm not going to spend as much time on the horses and mules because I, I feel like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like maybe hunters in general understand horses the most or mules the most. Um, it probably, I would, I would guess if you've had an interaction with pack animals, it's probably been horses in your life. Someone you know packs in with them or something. So um, llamas is kind of our forte, and then and then we'll touch on goats too. So. Okay, horses. Um, some advantages to having a horse. You can ride it. That's always nice, right? You want to talk about getting in and being able to hunt the next day. Um, if, you're, if your body, I would caution that your body needs to have a little adjustment to sit on a horse. Um, if you've never ridden a horse before and you jump on a horse for 10 miles, it's, it's not like sitting in your lazy boy for four hours or five hours. It will wreck you. You will, you will get off your horse the next day and you'll be doing this and it'll be just as if you had hiked in yourself anyway. So be aware of that, that if you're just planning on this big horse pack in, that you might need to put some miles on before you go in on a horse to accustom your body to sitting in a saddle for six hours or whatever. Or maybe you plan on walking, you know, half and half or something like that. My dad does that a lot with his horses. Uh, just, just mostly for the exercise, but I think part of it is you just don't, you don't want to sit in a saddle for, you know, a six hour horse ride in or whatever. So. But you can ride them, and that's a huge advantage that the other two don't have. Um, they're packable weight, obviously. Like, you can just put more pounds on a horse, that's, you know, obviously. Um, you know, I, I don't, how many horse, how many pounds do you think the average horse can pack? 300? Easy? No, 
push them in they, they too. I mean, I've seen them pack 300 pound people. <laughs> yeah. But substantially more than like the llamas and goats we'll talk about. Um, I think there's a nostalgia with horses, horse hunting. This is kind of, you know, for those of you who maybe grew up hunting on horses, like sometimes I like to just throw a gun in a scabbard, pop through the hills on a horse and just enjoy a good horse ride. And there's something to, you know, to be said about that. Uh, they're easier to find. Uh, there's horses, horses are almost dime a dozen. You know, you can get on KSL right now and probably find, you know, 50 horses within the valley here for sale that would probably do the job. They're a lot easier to find. Try finding a good pack llama within 50, 100, 500 miles, and your eyes will be open real quick. It is extremely hard to find a good pack llama or a good pack goat right now. Any questions on those? Anything that you guys want to add? Disadvantages. They're definitely more unpredictable. The horse guys in here are probably going to be, well, you don't know how to train them. You're probably right. But maybe other people don't know how to train them either, and that's that's just generally what I've seen over the course of you know 20 years of being around horses. Is generally they have an unpredictable. There's just something in their DNA. Every once in a while, something unpredictable is going to happen, and it happens more often with horses than with llamas and goats. Especially when they cross a llama. <laughs> yeah, especially when they cross a llama on a trail. It's funny that you say that. Horses. If you're with, if you in a pack string of horses, or if you're using llamas, horses hate llamas like it's a weird like if you've ever crossed llamas on a path with horses give the horses a wide wide berth because i don't know what it is i don't think they recognize them as a i don't know they don't recognize them as a normal uh, you know stock animal or whatever but they yeah, we've seen some some rodeos just from passing our llamas around horses Definitely more dangerous, especially if you're riding them, right? There's just a factor there that if you're sitting on a horse that has a come apart, um, it, there's a lot more danger there as opposed to a llama. Um, if it has a come apart, you might lose some gear or something like that, but generally you're not going to be the one to get hurt. Uh, the feed expense is obviously a huge disadvantage. Um, you know, we, I've got a slide at the end just kind of breaking down the general cost to feed a horse for a year. Um, but it's, you know, three, four times what it would cost to feed a llama and probably six, eight, ten times what it costs to feed a goat. Um, space, I didn't put space up here, but you, I mean, you just got to have some space to, you know, if you're going to be the one housing a horse, you're going to have to have some space. Um, time in the back country. Couldn't tell you what that means. I don't know what that means. It means how much, time, how much, how much you're much using time. them. Like, time you're using them. Yeah. Once you get in there, how much yeah. time you have to spend taking care of them. <laughs> Thank you for de deciphering my notes. Um, yeah, the t so time in the backcountry. We go in, we, we, we have all this vacation time, and we're back there for maybe a five-day hunt. It's not uncommon. Um, you want to utilize all the time that you have in the backcountry to be able to hunt, in my opinion. Um, it's not that we don't you know, go back to camp and take naps sometime or whatever, but there's a lot of days where we're just from sun up to sundown, we're out hunting. We're either glassing or we're on something. And to have to stop or to have to have that in the back of your mind that, hey, no matter what, I have to get back to my horses and take them to water tonight, that's just a factor. It's just something to, to think about. We can stake our llamas out, and as long as they've had water in the last two days and they're not working that day and I know that there's feed around them, they'll be good for another 36 hours. I, I trust them that much that I don't have to be back to get them to water or feed as long as the, the grass is there. Um, so yeah, having, you know, or you got to have someone in there that's just the horse guy. You know, we did that quite a few times with my dad. It's like, oh, we want to go hunt this and we want to take the horses. Would you mind coming along and kind of babysitting the horse while we go out and hunt? You know, that's, maybe he likes that and maybe he doesn't, but, you know, it's just something to think about. And then the training or the money, like either you're going to be the one to train a horse or you're going to be paying someone to train a horse. Um, and it's very technical. Training a horse to, to just a path is one thing. Training a horse to be able to ride and rein, um, you know, saddle, unsaddle, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole nother uh, time consuming and expertise that a lot of us just don't have. And so you're either, you're either going to learn that and you probably learn the hard way by making mistakes training a horse or you're gonna be paying big bucks to get a horse that's already broke that someone else has gone through that process. So just something to think about. I'd say another disadvantage of 
purposes, unfortunately, is people. People? Because I've left, I had a buck sketch <coughs> that I left tied up in the trees. I was down going after an elk. Heard a boom, and I was like, wow, that's kind of close. Shot your horse. And shot the horse. So, but we, we packed, with our llamas, we packed um, orange, reflective orange collars around their neck. Like, it goes on them from the second they leave. Because they, I mean, if you think a horse looks like an elk, a, like a bright colored brown llama looks just like a cow elk. This is just a neat picture. This is this is Floyd doing exactly what we're saying. You know, Jason had a hunt over in Nevada, and you know we needed to take the horse, and so he comes along as kind of the horse wrangler while Jason chases bucks around. That's a good horse right there. Okay, pack llamas. Jason is Jason's probably the the expert in the group here. Um, I'll run through this, and then we can run any questions you guys have with llamas. Um, through Jason or myself. Um, the first thing about pack llamas, and we've touched on some things, they're hard to find, they, um, you know, they're easier to keep than a horse, but um, first thing is they're not all created equal. Just because you get on KSL right now and you see a llama for sale, um, I've got one for sale right now on KSL. Her name's Tina, and she is just a guard llama. She, she's nothing to do with packing, she's $200, right? But I would, like, she doesn't even have that in her. She has never been packed with or anything, and I don't think she's even the right breed. She's got really long wool compared to our our pack llamas, like 100 pounds overweight. 100 pounds overweight, <laughs> yeah, so that cuts into the weight that you can pack on her. Uh, but no, the point is, like, there's, there's specific breeds of llamas and specific size and makeup of a llama that you need to be aware of. Um, it's it, horses, I believe, doesn't matter as much. Now there's differently different breeds of horses, you know, whatever, Clydesdales and Frisians and all these different breeds that you wouldn't necessarily take into a, a mountain hunt. Um, but generally what you're going to find on KSL, a quarter horse, a thoroughbred mix, some, something like that, and it really doesn't matter as much. You know, if the horse is a good broke horse, it, it could probably do the job. Pack llamas are, are a little bit different. You need to find the right makeup. Um, with our male packers, or even females, we're looking for taller and bigger. You know, sounds obvious, but we're looking for a llama that's probably at least 45 inches at the withers, up to 50 inches is kind of that magical, like, man, you got a, you got a 50 inch llama at the withers, that's a big, that's a big boy. Um, the pounds, anywhere from maybe 350, 325, up to, Anything over 400 pounds, is a, again, that's a big boy. You, you show me a 50-inch llama that's 400 pounds, and that if that sucker's broke to pack, he can haul, that thing can haul over well over 80 pounds, probably 100 pounds for longer than you can, than you can hike him, uh, 10, 15 miles. Um, so they're not all created equal. Yeah, go ahead. Um, everything that we've bought so far has been uh, a mature, mature animal for the most part. Um, we bought the our two best packers. Now were they were just what I would say up and comers. They were in that like four to five year old range. Um, they had had a lot of trail experience, just not a lot of heavy packing. But they're you know a llama. That's the other thing about a llama. You can you can break a horse and be riding a horse in the hills around. I mean as early as two, maybe three year old. Three-year-old. If you're working them hard, three-year-old. Llama is probably you're, you're pushing it at four. I think four is about the sweet spot. So you got an extra year there with a, a pack llama. Um, and something to keep in mind if you're if you're you know picking up younger uh, younger llamas. There's a there's quite a long lag there from when they're mature enough to pack. You you can take them in uh, when they're younger, but you just can't put full weight on them. So if yeah. they're a two-year-old or a three-year-old, you can do. 30, 40 pounds. Or, or even younger and just halt, halter them up and, you know, haul, haul them in just to get the experience. But um, honestly, to answer your question, any way we can. Like, it sounds, it sounds obvious, but they're, they're, so, they're so rare. Um, if, we, if we found the one that we're going to get, we'll, we'll buy them as a, a six-month-old weanling if that's the one we decide we're going to go after. We haven't done that yet. Um, but I'd pick them up any way I could. If it's the right, you know, if it's got the right genetics and 
you know, the mom was 47 inches and the dad was 50 and this is going to be a 49 inch llama and 400, like I'd go get him when he's six months old. But we're kind of in that, in the business, you know. If I was, if I was the consumer, um, unless you, that just wants to be your hobby is having a llama, paying for him for three and a half more years till he's ready to pack and putting the time in with the halter training and the saddle breaking and stuff, like, you know, I'd look for something that's broke if it was me. Is it better to have maybe three of them rather than two or even one? Two's the, two's the minimum. Um, they're, they're a pretty hurt happy animal. Um, unlike a horse, you know, horses, not that they're not hurt happy, but once they, you know, you, you ride them away from each other and they, uh, they do just fine typically by themselves. Um, llamas seem to be the other way. We, llamas just get weird by themselves. And do you, do you breed them and, and sell them to the public? We breed them. Um, we, we do sell them. Uh, it's, I say that tongue in cheek because we just we don't have a lot right now, and so we you know. But we we we're we're in the process of building a herd, um, and so we're not looking to sell a ton of them. We do have a, long, a pack llama for sale right now. Yeah, I, I wondered if llamas was going to spark some questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm interested in that, uh, the amount of feed. We've got the ratio up there, twenty percent on horses. We run mules. throwing a bag of uh, you know compressed cubes. cubes. The, yeah, they, they sell them in a 50, probably a 50 pound, I don't know. It's a it's a gunny sack size of cubes and I'm I'm ninety percent sure that's what most guys are taking into the backcountry. Uh, so on a daily basis what would a llama eat that happens? So if we know that we're going into a spot, let's say book cliffs for example, and I know this because we've been in there, right? And that that's the key to your question is if you're not if you haven't been in there you know, I don't know. I don't know what the feed looks like for sure. But if I have a good idea, um, we won't pack any extra feed for a llama. No. Pellets. Pellets. Even that. That's more of a. It's more of a supplemental. We'll pack pellets just because it's just a good, healthy. Like you know, here's a here's almost like a treat. Um, pellets are nice to have too if a llama happened to get loose because it's like crack to them. They're gonna, you know, you, you rat shit, you know, it's like grain to a horse. They're gonna come running and we usually can catch them that way. But if, if I was going back into the book list for another hunt this year, like, I don't think I'd pack a single pellet the, for The a grain's hunt. not for, like, the feed. It's just kind of like a, super here's a tree treat. type of thing. Supplement. Energy supplement. It's they don't need high. it. Do you use oats also? Like, we used to take the oats, put them in the bottom of the tank, and then put the eggs in there so they wouldn't get broken. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's just like a protein pellet. It's a pound a day per llama if like we're going into Nevada where now, there's no yeah, feed. Now in Nevada is a different story because we got up there and I mean in a 50 by 50 there wasn't 12 blades of grass. And so we were constantly, there was, I'm exaggerating, but we had to constantly move them each night and then I was supplementing them hard with pellets. You know, we were, I was giving them, you know, uh, at least a half pound a day of pellets, uh, or a, a half gallon Ziploc bag of pellets a day. Um, so to answer your question, it depends on where you're going, but you know, I would I would still be packing feed probably with horses, um, so that I didn't have to sit and watch them hobble, you know, out in the pa out in the field for three hours while they fed. Um, it's just different with llamas because you know, on the book list, for example, we could stake them in a you know a 24 inch circle and they couldn't eat the grass in there in a week, you know, and so we, we didn't even have to move them. Uh, so, anyway, just just one little, I think an advantage with llamas is if you know there's good feed in there, we don't have to pack anything. They're just, they're living off the grass and the forage. Yeah. So when you talk about you talk about elk and deer, and Yeah. Yeah. Let me, um, yeah, go ahead. So how long do the llamas live? They're going to live really looking at goats, and the goats, they say, you can keep them for up to 15 to 17 years. How long are the llamas compared to the goats? What's the life expectancy? 
I, I would probably say 20, 25 years. Uh, well, 25 is probably pretty long, but probably packable years around 15 to 20, depending on the moment. They say they hit a peak at seven, and then you can pack them for 10 like good years. From seven to 17 is really your kind of the sweet spot. Pre- 15 to 17 is about when you retire them. Well, well I'll, I'm going to come back to your rent your renting question, by the way. Yeah. How many acres per llama? Uh, once you get the llama, and also um, what type of shelter? And then uh, the other tra- question is transporting the uh, animals. Yeah. Um, acre per llama is tough because it just, it, I don't know what your pasture looks like in your feed. I mean, if you, if it's just plush green, you know, you're up in Logan, uh, it might it's going to be different than down in Mesquite, you know. Um, so that, that's tough to say. I, I as far as eating, my personal opinion is that. Three to four llamas eat as much as one full-grown horse. Kind mm-hmm. of been my experience. We've put llamas out in a pasture, let them eat for a while, and then put a horse in there, and within like two weeks, the feed's gone. And with the llamas, the feed still look pretty good. And are they eating shrubbery trees, or are they eating grass? That's another Everything. thing. The advantage of llamas is they'll eat anything, man. I've seen <coughs> eat, they eat cedar, cedar tree trees, bark, pine I've trees, seen pine needles. There was one llama we took in, he was an older llama, and I, I really think he just physically couldn't get down to the grass on the ground, he was really old. And we weren't using him to pack, we were just using him as a companion llama, because the, they need to be with another llama. And he, he wasn't eating grass, and finally I moved his stake and I put him next to a pine tree, he hammered that pine tree. And I'm like, oh geez, like, good thing I moved you, you know, because I think he would have just died from starvation. <laughs> but he was all about that pine tree. Like, the same with goats. Goats will goats prefer a pine tree or a cedar tree. I'm not kidding. They, they'll walk over a green blade of grass to go to a, a pine tree with pine needles. Horses just it's what little guy over here. The little guy. What's up, man? Yeah. Llamas don't. Do the llamas spit? I was waiting for it. Give him a good prize. <laughs> that is the number one, hundred percent, the number one question we always get with llamas. Do they spit? <laughs> Llamas absolutely will spit. Um, typically, they won't spit on you. It's like, yeah. We've got, it's peach green. We've got one llama that has a personal vendetta against my dad and just spits on him every time he does I think Jason trained it that way because he doesn't spit on anyone else. But all the time. But no, typically, it's like does a dog bite, right? So dogs will bite, and if you do something to maybe hurt a dog, a dog might bite you or do something to catch it off guard. Uh, but typically a dog's not looking to bite someone. Llamas aren't looking to spit on anyone. Um, mothers with young Kriya, right, the babies are Kriyas. A mom with a baby might spit on you if, you, if it feels like you're intruding on its, on its baby. Um, llamas spit on each other all the time. It's, it's just the, it's the pecking order. That happens all the time. They're spitting at each other. Around, day, around, day. Yep, around feed especially, but typically, no, llamas don't just spit on people. How much training do you need to put on a llama compared to like a horse? So that, and that's another thing, like on our advantages here, um, you know, they're easy, uh, easier handlers. It's just easier to train a llama, you know. A horse, um, geez, man, like... <coughs> months and months, day after day after day of just really technical stuff that you gotta, you gotta be dialed to be able to train a horse, you know, especially to ride. Um, llamas are just, yeah, a good solid year of just, you know, you know how it is. Um, llamas, I think, Jason's in the process right now of training two of our yearlings. I mean, what, I mean, just, you know, you starting out when they're younger, you just kind of pet them all over, because llamas, they're kind of like cats, they don't like to be touched. They're like, <laughs> They're really weird about that, and everyone, if you like go out into a field with llamas, they're going to walk away from you every time, unless it's just a weird, weird llama. <laughs> so, that's step one. Step one is getting them comfortable with you touching them everywhere, touch them on their face, their neck, back, legs. And then you start putting a halter on, which that can take a while. You start, you got to put the halter on quite a bit. They eat, and furthermore, they hate their face being touched. Yeah. Like, it's like their no-go zone, right? It's like, and so that's a big hurdle for a llama. Um, and maybe besides putting a pack on them is the only other, you know. You just start leading them around and they, they pick it up quick. Like, we've got two yearlings that I'm training and I mean, they, 
I get to the point now, I just walk in the pasture, put a halter on them, start leading them. It's a lot less effort and a little Fraction, more dummy proof. Fractions of the time to train a horse. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot more doable for this the average guy who doesn't know a tech, the technicalities of training, breaking, lead, you know, rain, rain training a horse. So much easier. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just have don't have to train a horse. Right. I mean, you're, you're, you know, it's like if you were just training a horse to pack, it'd be a lot easier than riding them. You know, there's just a whole other level there. There's, I, I think, right here. Uh, how many llamas does he need for like two guys? Well, how many Dr. Peppers do you want to take? <laughs> you know, and, and I say that for us, it's more like how, you know, what are we packing out? Um, if you're, you're elk hunting or deer hunting? Elk hunting. Elk hunting. Uh, so both have tags and both could like tag out maybe. Um, minimum, minimum what I would take would be four. If you if you want, so two two llamas, two llamas. If you pack your gear right, meaning you know if we're going into an elk hunt with two llamas, we're gonna pack the llamas as if they're just packing our 45 pound packs. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't get fancy with all the stuff because we know that as soon as that that elk hits the ground. The llamas are going to be taken up 100% with all the elk meat, and then I'm going to pack my 45-pound camp again, and the head and the horns or whatever, and that's a that's a good ratio for me. I'm willing to pack out the you know 100-pound load of head antlers to only make one trip. Um, so minimum minimum for an elk hunter, I would say is two. I would I would try to get three. Um, you know if an, if a llama can pack anywhere from 80 to maybe a hundred pounds if it's a big strong packer you know you can do the math on how much meat you're deboning off of a bull I, I packed out quite a few elk last year um, helping people and if you bone it out um, separate all the meat evenly each llama has probably 60 pounds or so and then you carry the head with so how many with four. Four, four llamas that's with four you can do it with three so so is it a little fact that we go to scale? Not there, yet. I have never seen a documented case of that being, but I also, you know, I've read quite a bit, and I no one's ever shown me a documented case of a domestic, like a pack goat passing it. I think it, the bigger problem is the guys grazing their sheep through the, the, the goat country. And the, so you don't know if a llama can, it makes possible again? I'm, I'm sure that it, I don't know. I've never seen anything. Um, them goats. passing diseases to sheep. Oh, and, and I don't doubt that they will. I mean, 100%, I know they will. It's just, you know, statistically, are we the problem, or is the guy grazing his, you know, 300 head of, of sheep through the country? Is that more realistically how these, these herds are getting, you know? I, I well, think llamas were just banned. On the salmon, the, the, the big ones are coming down. The Into the sheep country. Goats, you know, right. They don't know, and so, yeah, they're up in document. I've never heard of a llama uh, being the source of the type of I haven't either. We're not, I mean, we're not going to have, I mean, in theory, they could pass something that we don't know about, but we're not going to have a sick llama back in there um, it, almost ever. And then the amount of interaction we're going to have, um, you know, it's a, it's a very light footprint when we're back there with the llama. Sick. It's not a sickness. No. The pneumonia? <laughs> no, not, it's not pneumonia. It's a... Uh, oh. How do you pronounce it? Pa Pastor L. Pastor L. Okay. Yeah. 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 YouTube channel that goes in more extensive of what we're talking about? Um, we do, but we don't have too many videos. We have a lot of videos it. up. Um, and where do we go? Team, just Team Backcountry. Team Backcountry on YouTube. Um, what we do have, I know for sure, is we have a, a video of uh, just saddling, just generally how we saddle a pack llama. Um, and how that process goes, but there's a piece I had a question here for a minute. Okay, two questions. One is the meat issue. How are they with water? I know the llamas can go on a hunt. Can you rip me out for like the first two days and I don't take them to water? They won't drink, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen it a dozen, 25, 30 times now where you just think, okay, today's the day, pal. I'm going to walk you down there and I'll bet you drink. And they stand there and they, they turn their nose up at it. like. They're part of the camel family. They're literally part of the camel family. And so it's not that they're sick or anything, or they're, you know, whatever. They just don't need to drink that often. 
Um, yeah, especially if they're getting a little bit of moisture from the grass, dew in the morning or whatever, they just don't need it. They're part of the camel family, it's how they're built. Um, huge, huge advantage compared to horses. How often do horses drink? Those guys that have them every single day. Horses going to water every single day. Um, we're taking llamas more often to water to get water for us than for them. You know, and so we'll we'll go back, we'll take two llamas down to water, a water hole, and we'll buy those those five gallon collapsible buckets at Walmart or whatever. And each, you know, five gallons is roughly 40 pounds. So we'll put two of those full of water. We'll put two of those on one llama, 80 pounds of water. And we'll get back to camp. We'll fill up our bladders while we're there, along with just completely waterlogging ourselves while we're sitting there filling up stuff, right? And so we get back to camp with full everything, and we've got 20 gallons of water. We'll designate one of those just for llamas. So five gallons will just be a llama thing. The other 15 we'll use for the next three or four days or whatever. And we're drinking as much water as we can. We're having Kool-Aid, we're doing all sorts of cool stuff. Like, it changes hunting in the back of here, right? And then we'll just every evening maybe fill up our little collapsible buckets that we pack in with half water. Just go see. They might sit down, you know, three or four inches or whatever, but they've got five gallons to sip on. And, and then we really don't have to take them to water any more than that, you know. Unbelievable run out of water and start taking their water. Yeah. yeah. It'll drive you nuts. You'll take them every other day to water, and they just won't drink if they're not packing. Like. I thought they were <laughs> yeah. Did you say something about a fan? I don't know what your long legislation is. In Alaska. In Alaska? Because there's not enough people to find it. Yeah. Just a reputable packer, honestly. Um, so, so he asked about renting llamas, so we can, we can touch on this too. So um, there's, I don't know how many people there are, packers across the West. There's, there's not many that will rent llamas. Um, there's, there's quite a few in Idaho and Colorado. More up north. Um, we rent them, but we're down, we're, da we're down out of Mesquite. So we rent a lot to guys like, you know, California people coming through to go hunt, you know, northern Nevada or Utah or wherever they're going, Colorado. Um, so some things to look for, just, just a reputable packer. Um, what, uh, you know, obviously I think they need to be packing Cara, C-C-A-R-A, -A, you know, Cara bred llamas. Those are pack llamas that we're talking about. Um, I don't know what else. What else would you look for? Definitely with the gear. Uh, if yeah, if you're, I wouldn't even agree to that because we're a llama. A llama packer uh, and panniers are super specific. I mean, they're 100 percent for a, a llama. You can't. It's not like you can take your mule saddle and throw it on a pack llama. Um, so 100 percent, they need to be providing the gear. A good cost ballpark. Um, we're we're fairly cheap. And you can rent one llama for us with the trailer for what, 50 bucks a day? With per, the trailer? Per llama, and that would include a trailer? No. No. 50 bucks a day per llama plus 25 a day for a trailer. There you go. What type of trailer? I mean, you can't put them in a horse trailer because they're nagged. You can. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. If it fits a horse, it'll fit a llama. A lot of times, too, they're going to lay down while you travel. Um, so as long I've seen people. Not not hunters, but I've seen YouTube videos. Of, look it up. People putting a llama in a van. Check it out. <laughs> yeah, vet bills. Um, what are our vet bills run a year per llama? Maybe hundred bucks average. Well, we've uh, you know like, get them some shots. Yeah. If you want to do it yourself, you don't have to take them to a vet. Just give them the shots themselves. Yeah. Very hardy. They rarely get hurt. They're very hardy, unlike a horse. Yeah. They're not trying to kill themselves. Yeah, these 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 animals, you know, these animals were were bred and come from the Andes Mountains, you know, down south, fourteen thousand feet, and that's it's what they're made to do. They're made for the backcountry, and that's why it's a good fit for us. But um, ballpark fifty to seventy-five bucks a day per llama would be kind of a good range. Hundred percent. Yeah, get them in a pair, you know, so you can plan on a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks per day. Um, get them in, get them with the saddles and the panniers and stuff. 100%, if, if I was renting from a guy and he wasn't going to do an orientation with me, that would raise a red flag. Um, we do like a two-hour orientation mandatory on all of our packs. And so that's, that's another thing that we get is, um, you know, people being comfortable with taking a llama. Never been around them before. They're terrified of them. They, they think they're going to get spit on. 
you give us two hours, two hours, and we're going we're gonna to show you, and then we're going to make you go through the whole entire process. And we're, we, we do it all the time. We're going to feel 100% comfortable that you can take a llama out on a seven-day trip and know exactly what you're doing. Uh, Mesquite, down in Mesquite, Nevada, just outside Vegas. Um, I would never do that with a horse, ever. Someone who'd never been around horses, I would never do a two-hour orientation and then send them down the road and wish them good luck. <laughs> That's crazy. Used to my truck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on. We'll you want to do it yourself, just do it yourself. Um, Is there, what's the off you have to do that? So they, they have like toenails basically, and if they're in a in a field that doesn't have any rocks or anything like that, their toenails will start to grow, and you gotta you just gotta trim them. So I just have like little um, garden shears. It's not a dangerous proposition for somebody that's not fit what they're doing like a horse. Well. I mean, if the llama's trained, has been trained to pick up their feet, it's not. It's more the llama than you. You know, it's 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 not rocket science to pick its feet up and clip it. It's it's if the llama's, you know, well well behaved. We'll put them um, in the chute or something like that, and just tie them up and just pick their feet up. And it, it takes like a minute per foot. Pro probably need to have the right equipment if you're going to go down that road. You know, if you got maybe cattle shoot or something that you can uh, demobilize them. We'll, we'll trim them in the springs usually just because they've been sitting in the pasture all winter but uh, in the fall when they're out hiking and on the trails and with the rocks on their feet that you don't need to trim them. It just takes care of itself. It's, it's kind of an odd track when you see them. If you ever follow a llama in you won't know what it is. Almost um, looks like an elk but it looks like a backwards elk track. Yep. Yeah. They, you don't but, under, if you don't understand them you'll think you're yeah. You're going this way when you're going that way. I, I love I love hiking around with our llamas and then having the thought that someone behind me is like, oh, we're on to a good herd here. Like, this is a big bull. They're behind us with a, who that's that? Yeah, wouldn't that be funny? Yeah, we're going to have to What was the, what was your question? I can't remember. I've got so many things on my mind. What on a show. Oh, tethering on a trail. Yeah. Yeah, so what, like you're talking at camp, when we get back to camp? When you're pack, pack strings. Okay, yeah, so, um, and, and we need to touch on goats too, because I think there's some important things with goats. But yeah, as far as the tethering, um, you're always going to have them on a lead rope. You know, like he said, llamas are like cats, and not that they won't follow you on a lead rope. Even the best trained llama, though, you know, if he got off his lead rope, he might, he might start walking away from you and just say, mm, I, uh, I'm going to go over here, you know, and just be in the corner or whatever. Like What's that? Like a or what? <laughs> goats. Goats will, goats will talk about. It. That's how the goats are. Is, um, but no, you're always going to have them on a lead, and then we tether them one to the other, right? So the back of each one's pack will have what we call like a quick release or an emergency release uh, hook on it. And the way those work is, if you're familiar, is, uh, it's, it, it's, you can open it under tension, under pressure, right? And so that's really important. I, in fact, I've been in situations where one llama gets in a bad spot and um, the other, it, they tighten the rope up. And if it was just a normal hook, you'd never get it undone to separate the two. Um, and, but this one, these, these quick releases, if you're going to pack with them, uh, most, most packers should have these on the back of their packs that you're tethering but you can, you can open it under pressure, and that's important. Um, then once you get to camp, you're tethering them, um, dog staking into the ground, and just the biggest mistake, that, or the biggest problem they're gonna have is if you put them somewhere where their lead rope can get hooked into something. As long as you keep their you know, 15, 20 foot circle clear of debris and you know, bigger brush like sagebrush or trees and rocks, a llama is just not gonna get tangled on itself. So to get three of them all the tack and everything, you're looking at what, ten grand? Oh, to, to purchase? Yeah. If you can find them. Yeah, if you can find them. Just just depends, man. Um, we've picked them up as cheap as you know three thousand for like a real you know a, a llama that's ready to roll and as dialed packer. Um, just the other day, I, I was talking to a lady and she was asking like sixty five hundred for a eight year old nine year old male. That's so. the tack. I think it, was, it was with forward. the saddle. That was it. So. Yeah, clear in the back. Um, so, a lot of times we came out here to check and tell us on our way in. Sure. Uh, 
You want me to handle that? Corey's got a story. Corey's got a quick story for you on the Bo's, gunshot thing. Bo's not in here, is he? No, Bo Baby's not in here. So <laughs> his lawn was very rent. We, Dustin had <laughs> gone down. So Dustin, like, gets fixated on something, and he's just got to have it. So Dustin had bought pack goats um, before maybe we'd done a ton of research on it. And we were getting ready to run pack goats when we came across llamas. And Dustin did more and more reading on llamas. And... Uh, there's a guy up by Idaho Falls, uh, Bo Beatty with Wilderness Trail Llamas. He's got uh, probably the best llama herd in the lower 48. It's incredible. And he's a very passionate hunter. Um, he's an awesome dude. If you're, if you're going up to Wyoming or up into Idaho, um, he's the guy to go to as far as I'm concerned. But he, uh, he rented us a pair of llamas, and Dustin and I were going in on an elk hunt, and we were packing up the saddles. We had gone through the two hour, um, the two hours with him walking us through. This is our first trip with llamas, and this is us like trying to figure out whether we want to crawl down that wormhole of getting four llamas or you know getting our own. So, long story short. Uh, I know Corey Dustin, well enough to tell him to get to the punchline. Right. Dustin and I are packing up the saddles, and Dustin starts whispering at me, Hey, there's a coyote, coyote. And we're at the trailhead, and right down the trail comes a coyote. And we have a wolf tag in our pocket. It's an archery elk hunt. So we have a rifle with us. So I rip the rifle out, and uh, I'm walking up, and these llamas, we had stayed the night at the trailhead, and these llamas were all staked out. And this coyote just so happened to be on the other side of the llamas. Um, and I, it wasn't straight over his back, but it, it was, you know, very directly to the left of me, um, when I'm taking a shot at a coyote and it, uh, the, the llama was unimpressed. You know, he just kind of stood I, there I'm, you would have had a rodeo with a horse. I understood that he needed to shoot the coyote. It's every hunter's obligation. You see a coyote, you got a gun, you got to shoot it, right? And so I knew he had to take the shot. And then I'm watching that this llama is going to come unglued. Llama didn't flinch a muscle. I don't think llamas have near the skittish tendencies that a horse would have. To answer your question. These were these were great llamas, but we I mean we were hook line and sinker What's after that. that. A rodeo. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any extra considerations you take into account for when you're in wolf and grizzly? Stake those llamas as close to your tent as possible because they're a good uh, they're a good buffer. More for us, not. That's, yeah. Are you comfortable with leaving them for the day while you're out hunting? Though? So I, I we go solo most of the time. we have not ran them in grizzly country. Um, we're definitely in wolf country in in Idaho, um, and so I, I can't say what those guys do, but I, I know Bo's like Bo for example. He does a lot of Wind River stuff in uh, Wyoming. He's not taking any special precautions. Um, they're typically in bigger, bigger groups. You know, maybe four, six, eight, ten llamas. Um, but they're they're just not they're just not taking any special precautions. Um, one thing to be aware of is a llama. When a llama sees a bear or what it thinks is a bear, they have the most god awful, like screaming, uh, almost a screeching, laughing warning bark. Yeah. <laughs> And they'll, they, I mean, that's not even a fraction of how loud it is. And they will, <laughs> my mom's laughing at <laughs> Mom. The first time you hear it, it'll freak you out. It, it almost scares you more than, you know, than them. But, um, so we, we just use it, we use it to our advantage, you know, put them by your tent and then you've got a buffer if a bear tries to come in at night or whatever. I want to, I want to touch on pack goats real quick. Um, so, yeah, seven minutes. So. Real basics on pack goats. First of all, a good pack goat needs to be bottle fed, right? That's how you get a good pack goat, is they're pulled off their mom within the first week, and then someone's gonna bottle feed them for the first couple weeks for like three or four or five times a day, and then, you know, two or three times a day for the next couple weeks, and then three or four, or two or three times a day until they're, you know, maybe, can't remember now off the top of my head, couple months, you know, you're gonna do that. But that's what imprints a, a pack goat to just follow you around. And if you've ever been around bottle-fed goats, 
you get in a corral with them and they will not leave you alone. They're the most annoying animals on the planet. They're in your hip, they're nibbling on your pants, they're grabbing your hair, your shirt, whatever. They just, they're your best buddies like your dog. But a pack goat, if you're looking at pack goats, they need to be bottle fed. Uh, pack goats are hard to find too, honestly. They're um, maybe not as popular yet as, as llamas, um, but they're, they're tough to find. A pack goat will pack roughly 25% of its body weight and a big, strong pack goat like the equivalent of a 400 pound llama would be about a 200 pound pack goat. That's, that's a big boy. And so you might, you might get 50, 40, 50 pounds on him, which is pretty impressive. Um, a lot easier to, to transport and handle. Um, most guys with pack goats are just throwing them in the back of their pickup with a stock rack, and that's it. Can you, can you talk about this, just real quick, the difference between the conditioning for pack goats versus like uh, phys physical conditioning? Get for, yeah, get ready for season. I don't know. I've never conditioned pack goats. Um, I know our llamas, they'll definitely get out of shape, you know. Horses, horses will get out of shape. Goats. Just like anything. I, I don't know how to talk about the differences well enough, you know, that this one's going to take this many miles or this many trips to get ready. Um, I'd say ballpark with llamas, you know, you want to put maybe a, a good, you know, two or three trips. Uh, you know, real good, like, packing some weight, you know, at the beginning of the summer when you're, before you head in. Um, goats will eat, definitely eat less. I mean, you're talking, now you're talking a fraction of what a llama eats, you know, per goat. Uh, that being said, you're going to have to have maybe three or four times as many goats, you know, as you would a horse or a llama or whatever. You can do the math. Um, a lot easier handlers. No lead ropes, and I put that as an advantage and a disadvantage because, so no lead ropes going in would be nice, right? You just load up your five, six pack goats, and they're, you just head up the trail. I've seen it a hundred times on YouTube videos, and they just follow the guys up the trail, and they're just walking behind them. They kind of scatter out and just do their thing, but they're all coming, and they want to be with each other. The disadvantage to not having, like, the no lead rope thing is pack goats also don't like to be staked up and and tied down with the lead and so a lot of these guys it sounds crazy but a lot of these guys with goats are hunting throughout the day with their goats following them around couldn't believe it the first time i talked to uh who's the guy he hunted with south cox with with pack goats rodney york. rodney york and i'm having this conversation with him and he's trying to tell me that oh yeah not only do i hunt with my goats following me around but he said that he, he said it calms the deer down and he's saying that he uses them as like a decoy. And I'm like, you're crazy. And then I started thinking about like, you know, a goat to a deer or an elk is probably not much different than a, you know, a mountain goat or, you know, a desert bighorn sheep or whatever they're around. That's what the guy I saw this year said. Yeah. He said the elk will come check his goats they, out. They say it all the time. The guys will use their, their goats and the, you know, it's almost like the deer and elk are, you know, it puts them in a, a calms them down. So calming the wildlife. Believe it or not, I haven't seen it in the in person. But weather, the other key thing on goats you got to be aware of is goats are susceptible to the weather, way different than a llama. A llama has a wool, right? And these suckers can handle from 100 degree temps down to negative 25, and they can weather it pretty well um, without shelter. A goat, if you get a goat in negative 25 degree weather, you that sucker better have a shelter at least covering him out of the moisture. Um, you know, because they just don't have wool, they have hair and they're a lot more susceptible to the weather. So, man, some ways to use, we won't get into this, but obviously you could obviously go on a guided hunt with pack animals, a drop camp, a pack out service. We do this a lot with guys for elk. They don't want to necessarily mess with llamas for a week of their elk hunt, but we're close enough and they're willing to pay the extra for gas that we go pack, you know, they drop a call and we go pack them out the next morning, their elk, and it takes us one day and... You know, cops. Logan. Logan to be pushing it. <laughs> if if I was, yeah, that's a little. That's the only disadvantage as far as we go is that's just you know we've got a radius that would make sense. Uh, and then definitely renting them. We talked about that. And then you know obviously owning them. Cost. This is this is cost in my opinion cost to keep per year. And these are just ballpark ranges. The horse guys, I may be up or, you know, I may be off a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks or whatever, but, you know, maybe 2000 a year. I don't know. How does that higher? Probably higher for one horse, you think? It depends on the horse. I know, actually, horse, you can put it in a padded room and it still hurts. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, we've got the advantage. We've got a, a ranch with, you know, a few acres of pasture, and so we can take them out there for, you know, half a year or whatever. But fall park, fall park, 2,000 bucks. Llamas, fall park, 700 bucks. That'd be feed all your meds, and maybe you need to take a shot, you know, to the, the uh, vet to get them trimmed or something. And then goats would be substantially less. That's just ballpark. Um, cost of purchasing, I would say a good pack goat, maybe three, four hundred bucks. A good pack llama would be more like three or four thousand bucks. Um, and and a good horse, honestly, you know, because there's so many of them, about the same, maybe three, four thousand bucks. Five thousand. Mules more. Mules are mules more. are yeah. A good mule, you find a good mule, and they'll be. They seem to go for more than a you know a equivalent of a horse. Any questions? How much does it cost like all the gear for like a llama? Expensive because it's so specific, right? And there's not very many llama pack llamas out there. Like these guys are building these pack uh, these packs like specific the good ones, the good ones that we use, and they've got like a a wooden rail that rides right inside the, the uh, back straps there, off their spine. Um, you know, and then we got panniers that hang off the side. What do those run? A set, like a good? Uh, custom set, they usually charge like six, seven hundred bucks for just the saddle. Panniers are an extra three hundred. So you're about a thousand bucks for a full saddle set. Uh, we use some that Bo made and um, Al Ellis in Wyoming. Yeah, kind of. If you're familiar with Al Ellis, Sawbug World, he's, yeah. he's been around a long time over in Colorado. Yeah. So do you mix pack and the pony do? I'm getting huh. over this. I like to ride a mule. I know how they make them, but it's complicated. Trail of bunch of llamas. As long as the mule or the horse is okay with it, the llamas aren't going to have a problem. I don't think it's. You know, our horses have been around our llamas now. No problem. Uh, it's the horses that have never interacted with the llama, and then you just introduce them on the trail. They have it come apart. Jason, so, Jason and I went in once, and I was riding a horse, and he was leading llamas. Now, I never did lead the llamas from the horse, so I, I don't know how that worked. My horse did not really like being behind him, and the llamas did not like the horse behind them. When I put the horse in front, everybody was happy, and then he come, you know, 50 yards behind me, and everybody was just... I don't know what would happen if I would have tried to lead them off the horse. I've seen people do it. Um, they just you just gotta train them, you know. Yeah. I've seen people ride a horse and leave one llama behind. Socializing. You gotta be socialized with yeah. the llama. Yeah. You gotta it's spend not time. The other way. It's not the llama with the horse. The horse with the llama. It's the horse with the llama. Yeah. Oh, scared to what are your fencing requirements for a llama? Al has got huge fences all the way around the <laughs> If you've got males and females near each other, they need to be big. Yeah, it, like likes like, to pick up two males, for instance. Two males, four barbed wire fence, just like a horse. They don't. They don't. Okay. I've never had experience. They never go through fences. They don't try and touch fences unless there's females around. Yeah. You got an uncut male llama. They're the most athletic creatures on the planet, and they'll jump right over a four-strand barbed wire fence. Okay. Like that. Yep. <laughs>